to our meeting tonight on uh, decoding the past, and I guess I'm one of the past treasures of the county. <laughs> not really. I'm not from Dutchess County, that's why I can say that. I'm originally from upstate, or what you would call upstate. I call this, it overstate. This is here in Elmira. And I also want to welcome my cousins here who have come from Rochester and Boston, and the one from Portland, Oregon hasn't made it yet. She got waylaid on the way. <laughs> Oh, they're actually here for Sheep and Wolf oh. Festival. <laughs> but we're spending the time together finally. <laughs> um, uh, a few points of things that I need to bring up. We have rewritten our bylaws. According to our current bylaws, they have to be presented to you, to the general membership a month before you actually vote on them at the annual meeting. The annual meeting is our November meeting. So that all of you will be asked to vote on these then. If you want to see them and read them, you can get a copy from Jim Sweeney online if you just ask him and he will send you one. Or you can go to the town hall, the village hall, the library, or Merit Books. There's a copy in all four places so that you can read the bylaws as we've rewritten them. We took the Dutchess County Historical Society's bylaws as our guide to writing them. That's where we took the format from. So if there's any questions, you can tell you Blue Lewis <laughs> and let him know. <laughs> Diane, I'll, I'll leave a three copies here. So anybody wants to look at them during refreshments time, they can. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, other things, uh, let's see. We also, I want to make sure we'll send it out with our next flyer, but on November 18th, there's going to be a film on uh, Alden Terrace or Hogan's Alley, whichever you want to call it, of the early immigrants from Italy. Uh, have, their families have been interviewed. Barbara Purse, who did the Museum in the Streets, and her nephew, who is a professional filmmaker, has put this film together. It's about 35 minutes long, and it's debuting in Millbrook on November 18th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then the next day on uh, Sunday, the 19th, it will be in Millerton. It's also going to be submitted for several uh, different film festivals. So, and about, I think there's 18 or 19 local people have been interviewed and filmed and for this program. Uh, and if anybody has any questions or wants to know what's going on in the rest of the county, Will Tatum's site will let you know. Mm -hmm. He's our Dutchess County historian, and he also has a thing where you can sign up and you will get emails if you're on email, and you'll get notifications of what's going on in the county. We also have a Facebook page, which I tell you on the, in the newsletter. How many of you know anything, have computers, and do anything with Facebook? Okay, good. And, well, even if you don't, if you don't have to go on Facebook, we will, on our next newsletter, give you what to put in to actually go directly to the site for uh, Millbrook Historical Society's Facebook page. And then you can, f uh, and Jim is putting up different pictures right now of, of old pictures from Millbrook. What are they, Jim? I'm actually sharing pictures from another Facebook group or page called Growing Up in Millbrook, is the name of it. Okay. So they're old pictures, and they're very interesting. I just like looking at them. Some of them I know what they are, and some I haven't had a clue where they are, what they are. So anyway, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Will. Will's our presenter tonight, and he will tell you more about the coding in the past and what he found in our archives. Thank I you. I think that's right. That's more or less. Good evening, everyone. How are you guys doing tonight? Are you awake? Are you ready for a, a rollicking roll through Millbrook history? <laughs> Laughter is really all I'm asking for. I've spent all day with state parks in the Dutch Consul General's office 
discussing Dutch history in the Hudson Valley, so this is a nice refreshing break in, uh, in comparison to being in a room full of other government people. But I'm not your only presenter tonight. We also have your beloved town of Washington Village Millbrook historian David Greenwood. Hello, everyone. And we also have Melody Moore from the Dutchess County Historical Society. And if you have any questions about those bylaws, you can also ask her. So, decoding the past, how many of you have seen TV shows like Mysteries at the Museum or History Detectives? So I see three, four, five hands. All right, great. This is going to be really new and awesome for most of you. So the idea behind decoding the past is most of the time you're probably accustomed to coming to a historical society program or museum program and someone will stand up and talk to you for about half an hour or 45 minutes, give you a really polished description and story about something. Well, that's wonderful, but the, the downside of that is you don't get to see all of the work that goes into creating that presentation. So the purpose behind Decoding the Past is to give you sort of the, the worm's eye view, as it were, of how we go about figuring out the stories that are contained and represented by these objects. So it's going to give you an idea of what historians, curators, librarians, pretty much anyone who's in a setting where random boxes arrive and you open it up and wow, it's full of old stuff that someone in California found in their laundry room. It's like, oh, it's, it says Millbrook on this. I guess that's in New York. We'll send it back there because we need space for another dryer or something of that nature. <laughs> or you're going through your collection storage, which this is not something that has happened at Millbrook because you guys have excellent records, but at other historical societies, you go through collection storage and you say, wow, what is that? I really don't remember that coming in. And you look through all of your paperwork and there's not a whole lot of information on it. So then you have to go diving into all sorts of things, ranging from internet research to calling colleagues to you know, asking everyone in the historical society, do you remember what this was? Do you have any ideas? So in tonight's program, we're going to go through three groups, actually four groups of objects, and we're going to essentially talk you through our process and figuring out what these things were, what their significance is, and how they came into the uh, Historical Society's collection, not necessarily in that order. But to kick it off, David, as always, has some show and tell for you. So, Dave, thank you. Uh, turn things over to you. As a teacher, thanks, please, thank you. Uh, as a teacher, uh, I love a captive audience, so thank you for being here tonight. Um, and I've also learned in the years of teaching that to have something that we can share and really look at. The slides are wonderful, the PowerPoint is wonderful, but I'd like to start off with something else. Now, history is context, and to know the context. Now, if I had this in another part of the state, would anyone know what it is? Okay, it's a zip code, and for those of you who are not from here, can you guess what the zip code area might be? Take a guess. For those of you who are visiting. Bingo! It's clever. Perfect. You get an A. Our zip code. We know it. We take it for granted. And that, in history, can be an easy solution or a problem. Because there are times we think we know something and we may not be accurate. So, having said that, let me do a bit of the show and tell. How many of you graduated from Millbrook High School? Wonderful then you might all recognize what this is. What is it? It's in plastic, thank you, because it's to protect it. The archives takes its responsibility of um, uh, proper storage seriously. So it's in this so that I can touch it and hold it without getting greasy fingerprints on it. And David, it's also on the screen behind us. Yes, and it's on the screen behind us. So what is it? A yearbook. What year? 1928. Wonderful. That's great. Now, what is the subject of the cover? The Spirit of St. Louis. But look close. What does it really say on it? No, it says Spirit of MMS, class of 1928. 
Now, why would that be on the cover of the yearbook? Is it the middle school? No, no, no. The Middlebrook Memorial School. M -M -S. That, that was the year of the flight, wasn't it? No. The flight was actually in April of 1927. And what was the flight? Lindy, does that help? Yeah. Lindbergh, the spirit of St. Louis. And where did he fly from? From Long Island to? Paris. Paris. Now, that was such an amazing thing because that was the first time it happened. So, the yearbook took advantage of it. Everyone would recognize it, of course. But there are other things. Now, let's see how clever you are. Can any of you guess what this is? The spirit of St. Louis. And if you look at it, it's actually embossed on the side. 1928, this was patented. Now, for generations, of children. This is the kind of toy everyone would want. Today it may be interplanetary or galactica, but here this was the reality of it. Now, what's the material? Metal. metal. And originally the metal would have been very light. But what's happened? Now if you look, if I pass it around, and you'll look at it later, you'll be able to tell where generations of children held it to play with it because it's all worn off at the finish. So this is a term that I love, deer worn. Now we've heard the word care worn. Yes? Deer worn. What does deer worn mean? It's been used with love, worn with love, deer worn. And that's what this toy is. So hopefully that will get us thinking about something else too. And just to show you another aside, cards. This is a card game from 1927. And what's it called? Lindy. And the rest of it? The new flying game. And it's a, it's a card game. And in it, you've got the instructions but you've got cards, and the cards, you play to see who's going to get to Paris first. Okay, and you've got landmarks, 200 miles, headwinds, gasoline, all the things that you might encounter. Hugely popular. Now, I could spend the whole night just talking about um, games related to Lindy, but let's look at the slides. So, put the lights down. Let's look to our first one. Here we go. Oop, that's the cover. Now, we're going to come back to it, but before um, we get into the actual plane, I actually, let's go ahead to the next slide. Oh, good. Okay, this is the way that model would have looked when it was new. That's the box, all the elements you get put together, and they do other things too. Here's another word that students today wouldn't know, dirigible. What is a dirigible? Or dirigible? Hot air balloon. Hot air balloon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those are the things that at the time would have been so popular and so common, everyone would have known about it. So this is what the original set would have looked like. Do you think it's ever been used? Yeah. No, there are no, no fingerprints, no rest of corruption, corruption on it. So this was put in a box, put up in a shelf, and forgotten. So was it dear worn? No. It was ignored. And in the historical society, that happens a lot. We may have things that were used every single day, or things that were put up in an attic and forgotten. Thank you, Grandma. Into the attic it goes. But we uncovered them, and the clues are extraordinarily important. Now, back up. So, we recognize that. We all know the Millwork Memorial School. It's also called Thorne Memorial School. The very second page, you open it up and it says, Thorne Memorial, so they're interchangeable. But the M for Millbrook is important because all the all the T-shirts, all the sweaters, all the, the images have the MMS on it. And so most of you going through the school would remember that. But look more closely. You recognize anything in the design pattern that you might think of as plain. Swastikas. You all see the swastikas? Now, who do we associate the swastikas with? Nazi Germany. American. But wait, what, what was the year that the plane flew? 
1927. If you went online and looked at planes from World War I, American planes, a number of them have swastikas on them. Now, why? Because at the turn of the last century, the swastika became such a popular image of good luck that it appeared everywhere. So the planes ended up having swastikas on them. Not all of them, but many of them. And here is something that very few people would know. You see the propeller? The original propeller had a swastika on it. And it was carved into it, and the name of each of the craftsmen who made that special plane signed it. So the swastika was very much associated with it. But how did everyone know it? Because when it got to Long Island and they were set to go, the crew realized that had brought it that the propeller was cracked. So he, it couldn't fly with it. So they had to take it off. And literally, just down the road, you get a new one crafted really fast to put it on so that he could leave in April. But what was left behind? The old one that had a what on it? A swastika. So that's the reason for all the patterns. Now, let's go back to Hitler. What was the party he represented? The Nazi party. Now, when was the Nazi party created and established? 1920. And guess what, what Hitler had them incorporate into the sign? The swastika. Why? It's good luck. Everyone bought into it. Everyone bought into it. But because of what happened later with um, World War II and the Nazis, Germany outlawed the use of the swastika anywhere in the country. So you could go to Germany today, are you going to find a swastika? No. And what Germany tried to do with the, the European Union was to get all of the European Union to outlaw it. And guess what? The European Union said no, because it was a whole different issue for them. So here we have a cover, local history, but you see how much detective work, how much stories go beyond it. So we could say, yes, okay, so you're about to move on. But the details tell us so much about the time, the place, and who we are as a generation. Yes? I thought the swastika was also found in American Indian art. Be, thank you. No, it isn't. The mistake is, it's India and Asia and Japan. And if you look at the records, they say Indian art. But it's not Native American. Oh, okay. Okay, that's the assumption. Well, they're all later because of the popularity with it as a symbol of success and luck. So it's interesting just the, the context. Now, let me do a, one more show and tell. <coughs> Actually, two. But, so you've seen this. Now, what do you think this is? A box. It's a box. Bingo. That's really important. What kind of a box? Archival. Now, what does that mean? Acid-free. Acid-free. So, archival paper. How many of you have put things in the attic in a cardboard box that maybe held wine bottles? The size is good, so you put all your grandma's letters in that box and put it up in the attic. Guess what? The acidity in that cardboard can destroy whatever is in it. So archival means, simply put, that it's acid-free. And they're very specific, and you can go online. And Kathy Derringer, who is part of our archives collection, is the one who orders them. So you see, no writing, no publicity, no glue. It's the way it's constructed. And what is in it? Oops. What is in it is this. Now, can you see what it is? It happens to be a scrapbook. Why can't you see it? Because the archival paper before and between each page of it to keep it acid free. Now, that's the cover, and it's fascinating. So what was the scrapbook? Can you see, can you make it out? Mason and Hansen, Woolens and Fine for, uh, trimmings. And what year? 1902, 1903. So the box, the book is that big. 
Now, if you saw it, you may not consider it anything important for us until you open it up and the next. Bingo. It is what had been a, a booklet for fabrics is loaded with clippings on local history. Of articles, newspapers, who died, faces, loaded and loaded and loaded. So, obviously, page one is going to be George Washington. And why? The town of Washington. That's our association. And in addition, there's lots of other clippings that deal with um, murders and things being stolen and the day-to-day -day risk of how communities function. Jewel thief. Jewel thief, absolutely. And the next page. Oh, first of all, David, before yes. we move forward, can you tell us a little bit about how this came to be in the collection? Oh, yes. Collection? Now, many of you know uh, Lou Carison, or the Carison family. Yes? Well, his brother, living in New Jersey, had a friend who said, uh, you grew up in Millbrook, didn't you? And the friend, who happens to be Lou's brother, said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, well, I've got something. Uh, maybe you should have it. And what was it? Well, that friend from Grace Church, years ago, years and years ago, Grace had a tax sale, getting rid of things. And what was in it? But this scrapbook filled with newspaper issues and things. And at the time, no one wanted it, because it old, yellow newspapers. So he bought it at the tag sale, took it to New Jersey, and sat on it for 50 years. Oh, no. And then he realized, uh, maybe it should be someone who has connections with uh, Millwork should have it. So it was given to Lou's brother, and Lou's brother gave it to Lou, and Lou gave it to the archives. You follow? And my, the brother wanted it to come, come to the archives, but the man who had purchased it to begin was very ill. And he, they wanted him to know before he died that it would find its way back to Millbrook. So that man was overjoyed, overjoyed that it was coming back to where it would be. Now, what is the name of the newspaper? The newspaper is very, we think of the Millbrook Round Table as the standard for it, but there, there are other variations on the names too. So there are a couple of different ones, but they're all, collectively, it's going to be the Millbrook Round Table. Now, if we go to the next page, this is the kind of page after page after page. You recognize buildings. You recognize individuals. Now, in variations, these are already available in, uh, in postcards and other uh, traditions. Carmine D'Arpino, Louise Tompkins, another name many of you know, did articles and used these images in them. So much of what's on this page right now is pretty common knowledge. So you think, OK, these are newspaper articles. How important can they be? Well, the fact that someone put them together, one, is a great clue. But if we go to the next page, it just so happens that we have two of the Dean brothers. You know the name Dean brothers? They had basically one of the earliest stores. And Jack Dean comes up from New York every Monday and volunteers at the archives. So he's put together the Dean family history. And he had every photograph of everyone except the original Dean brothers. So he's there looking at it going, oh, that's nice. He goes, oh, I've spent my whole life looking for these. The fluke, the needle in the haystack. And that's why this kind of information is so valuable. If we had the time, I could go through every single individual. They all have a connection with local history and details, um, including this woman who is 102 years old at the time. And this is in, this happens to be in 1902. And she's 102 years old. And they're celebrating, the fact, all the stories that she has to say about her family. How quickly time uh, passes. But the stories we have to save them is so important. Next. <coughs> Now, this is easy. Most of you should know who this is. Oakley Thorne. Is the name Thorne rings a bell? Yes. Oakley Thorne. A very important name. Lots and lots of things. But here's the name. Russell, you may not know. Who was the most important on this page? He was. 
And why? Because he was the one in charge of all the gardens at the Heim, the Dietrich estate. And he was world famous for what Dietrich did. The estate was extraordinary. And what he ended up doing is causing Mrs. Thorne to compete with him. So Mrs. the gardens that we see at Thorne, the Thorne estate today were a result of her competing with this person from another estate. Interesting story and the dynamics for it. Next. Now, isn't this a wonderful picture? Now, uh, in reading through, you may not know who it's about. But here is the name. Flagler. Whoa, we all know Flagler. But we think of H.H. Flagler, who is the son of this man. H.H. H. Flagler's estate was directly across from the Golf and Tennis Club, and it was known as Edgewood. The stone wall is still there, okay? Mm -hmm. Now his daughter, that man's daughter, ended up coming back marrying, and she and her husband bought up lots of properties because they were going to do their own estate. Well, they never quite built their mansion. They did build a tea house, and where would that be? Cary Arboretum. Okay, so Cary Arboretum, Mrs. Cary's maiden name was Flagler. So you see the Flagler connections. But this article is about the grandfather. Now, the grandfather's backstory is extraordinary, extraordinary. Because as a young man, he invested in salt and went bankrupt. He was in Ohio. So he said, gosh, what am I going to do? So he ended up getting a job from the Harkness family. And the Harkness family had been pretty successful. And so what this M.H. Flagler does is marry the daughter of the boss. Have we heard this story before? Okay. So suddenly, he's got enough money to be able to look around. And one of the guys he palled around with was a Rockefeller. And what they ended up doing is cornering the market on oil. And the company that they created, Standard Oil. That's where this huge amount of money came from. And you read about his life, it's extraordinary. Now, he was involved with Rockefeller because Flagler, because his pet interest, railroads. He loved railroads. And he ended up working it out to get the uh, oil from one place to another to another. Railroad cars. So his passion was, and his, his whole focus was on railroads. Great. That's, the rest is history, except something you don't consider. His wife, Flagler's wife, was very sickly, and she couldn't deal with the cold climate. So she, he did something that was very unusual at the time, because he had the money. <clears throat> what did he do with his wife? They went to Florida, and he looked around in Florida, and it's this sleepy area, and he said, this is really great. I'm going to build a hotel. I'm going to build a hotel. I'm going to build a hotel. And then he realized there's a network of islands just off the coast that were virtually impossible to get to. And he ended up buying up property and having his railroad go out over it from one island to another island to another island to another island. And everyone said, you're nuts. You can't, you can't have a, a train go over the ocean. But he proved them wrong. And Key West is a good example that he built and bought up. And most of the property <coughs> along there, he made a lot of money on. But at the time this appeared, they were ridiculing him because of the hurricanes. He had started to build them, and one of the longest ones, a hurricane came through and wiped it out completely. So he built another section. Hurricane came through, wiped it out completely. And he kept throwing money at it. Here's another thing you don't know about, and that is, who did he get to work in the horrible conditions to put those railroad tracks in? Two groups. The Irish. Why? Because they were immigrants. They were desperate for jobs. And they didn't know anything about Florida. So huge numbers of Irish went down. And for the first time, what? Mosquitoes. mosquitoes. They never experienced mosquitoes. They couldn't believe it. Not only was it a horrible job, but mosquitoes were overwhelming. The second group, 
desperate for jobs. No. Southern blacks. Now, they were used to mosquitoes, trust me. But the amount of money that he was paying individually was more than they could get anywhere in the South because he was desperate for workers. So the long and short of it is, this article proved him them wrong. He was extremely successful and made so much more money than anyone expected. Amazing details. And it's all part of our local history. Now, one other thing that I discovered today, and I just have to share this. Our community is basically the result of Quakers in the area. Now, we all know that. To be a Quaker from the 17, late 1780s on, you could not own a slave. Why? Because we are all made in God's image. So if you had a slave as a Quaker, you had to do what? Give them their freedom. So that is something every textbook is going to tell you. What I discovered today, though, is that most of those Quaker families, many of them at least, had indentured servants. Now, what's an indentured servant? Know the word? You, you're given money in exchange for working for years, sometimes six and seven years, for the person who lent the money to. And where did those Quaker families use their indentured servants? In all the mills and all the properties that they had. They needed a workforce. So by getting the money, to be an indentured servant, that's what you did. Yes? I thought the indentured servant meant that the family, the person who put the upfront money, paid the passage across the Atlantic. That's what I happened. I thought that was the that's, indentured that's, part. Uh, that's what happens later with the, with the great immigration users. But, but early on, on, indentured, yeah. And we'll see some paper because of the documents from the Merritt family. So I'll show you that in just a minute. So that scrapbook that we have is a treasure trove of local history and details. And anyone can see it. Just make arrangements with Kathy and to go to the archives when it's open. And she'll show you the book and you can look through and discover your own relatives who might be in there if something else is hidden. So this is the first lost and found. So, Will, Melody? Well, Melody, did you have any thoughts on scrapbooking in general? I know you were gonna look at that. Well, one of the things that interested me about this um, Can everyone hear okay? Pardon me for interrupting. Yay? Yay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the things that interested me is um, a lot of the scrapbooks um, tended to have mixed media. You know, as people were creating scrapbooks, they were putting in photographs and ephemera. So whoever was, was putting this together was clearly looking at the news. And you do find that a lot, I think, in the first quarter of the 20th century. Um, later, uh, I think provoked a lot by young college women, um, they started taking on more of the ephemera and cards and, and letters and, you know, more memorabilia. But um, scrapbooks in general, and this is certainly one type, um, go back to the 15th century in England. And at that time, they were called commonplace books, and they were very popular, and, and people tended to write in them. They were writing their memories and thoughts and, and recording things. Um, later in the 16th century, you get into what are called friendship albums, um, and they are more, as we saw earlier, like today's yearbooks. And, and you know, writing to your friends and recording the memories of your friends. Um, some people claim that the, the, one of the most famous scrapbookers was Thomas Jefferson, who, um, who collected and created album after album of pages containing clippings of his presidency. So he um, apparently had a bit of an ego and was keeping track of everything that was written about him, um, not unlike presidents of all time, I guess. Um, and then another famous person associated with scrapbooking was Mark Twain who capitalized on the idea and created what was known as Mark Twain's adhesive scrapbook. And of course, um, one of the problems with scrapbooks that David's alluded to, and I mean, you just start thinking about the term adhesive, and how many of you have collected photographs over the years and you put them in, in adhesive albums and now you're finding out it's the worst thing in the world you could have done. Um, so um, scrapbooks in general, in archives and collections, 
you love to get them and you hate to get them all at the same time because they've been glued in, they discolor, you can't take them apart. And so uh, David talked a little earlier about interleaving the pages with, with acid-free paper so that you can cut down on the migration of the acid from page to page. Um, and I was interesting to learn that, uh, for me, that, you know, scrapbooking, you know, you wonder, well, where does that come from? Well, it comes from collecting scraps, scraps of paper. And as many of you know who may go to Joanne Fabric or Michaels, it's a huge business again. Scrapbooking is, you know, very, very popular. So, we'll... Can you all hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Save a little bit of uh, power there. So, how many of you remember the old scrapbooks, not the adhesive ones, but the black paper ones that you would stick stuff into? That's, those are a, um, a particularly, that essentially marks the beginning of the purpose-made scrapbook tradition in America. And I actually have a couple of uh, family scrapbooks of that type. They're kind of terrible because as time goes on, everything falls off of them. But if you're familiar with those and you're familiar with the self-adhesive ones, you may well ask, well, why did someone take a catalog and, and paste into that? Well, that tradition, at least here in America, goes really all the way back. It reflects both the difficulty in getting blank books, because if you're going to go to the expense of getting a blank book, say with lined paper or whatnot, you're probably not going to paste things into that. You're going to write in it like a commonplace book. A lot of these that we see in the era before the purpose-made black page books are just like this one. They're old catalogs, but um, even more sort of crushingly, they're store ledgers, they are personal diaries, and you find this out because as just with the self-adhesive ones, pieces will flake off. And so you see underneath it, a friend of mine in Texas was telling me about one yesterday that he got that was 1840s newspaper clippings pasted in over an 1820s store ledger. <laughs> so it, it gives you a sort of additional insight into today we would treasure that store ledger, we would treasure that commonplace book, but just a few decades after these things were created, people were taking them and pasting items into them. And we actually have one in the county's collection that probably comes from the county courthouse slash infirmary that looks like it is an old store ledger book that one of the people there took and pasted newspaper articles in. And ironically, I think today most of us think of scrapbooks as, okay, you're gonna paste in photographs, maybe some art that the kids or the grandkids did, but pretty much right up until the late 19th, early 20th century, that era of the black paper, it's newspaper clippings. And they're just taking a pot of glue, putting some on the back, gluing it into whatever they can find. This one hangs together because it, it's targeting the community of Millbrook. Some of the ones you see coming into the historical society, the ones that Will's talking about, are so random that you, you can't you can't piece together who the people are, what the story is, so there's no theme. And, and that's the sort of sad side of an early ledger or account book getting pasted over. And you desperately want to get to the information below the clippings. But this one is And you'll see later when we have our break, uh, I'll, I'll have it open so that you can actually see it. The reason this was selected is that because there were fabric panels, uh, pieces of fabric throughout it, the heavy, the paper is really very heavy. So it was designed, it was beautiful for this. It kept together. It wasn't lightweight because all the cloth would have been removed and then you could paste down the images for it. Now the images are pasted in a rather random way, whatever happened that week, put, 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 put it down. So you'll go from a wedding to a funeral to a fire to a theft to a, a horse that uh, ran down uh, Main Street and knocked <laughs> children with bicycles because they were afraid of bicycles. He thinks that the day-to-day -day reality for it. Now, the next slide is truly remarkable. <coughs> now, can you tell what this is? They're looking at individual parcels and the parcel numbers. This is dividing up land and pieces. 
Now, what it tells us collectively is really important, but how we got them is the extraordinary story. Now, can you tell what it's in? An archival envelope. But in it is a deerskin sack. And on the deerskin sack, it has 1836. That's the date. And it's from the Merritt family. And we know the name of Merritt, Franklin Merritt. Okay. The Merritt family had collected all of these documents, original documents, of genealogy, of weddings, of inventories, of property sales. And they were all kept together. And they were in this uh, leather envelope in Florida, it happened to be. And Kathy, what happened? Uh, well, I've been contacted by the owner of all well, these 70 documents, and she was the, well, I can't remember how many generations down, but uh, she had wanted, her, her mother had wanted to bring these documents back to us. Her mother passed away, and the woman that I was dealing with, her name was Carolyn Bazette, and uh, she was probably in her 70s at the time and very ill herself. Anyway, she had been talking to me for almost a year. Finally, we made arrangements, and she was uh, driven up to, from Florida. Um, and her son lives in uh, Rhode Island, and they drove over to Millbrook to drop off these documents. And they were in the deerskin. All 70 of them were in the, folded up and in the deerskin. And they had been in the mother's um, laundry room, as David sort of intimated earlier, right next to the soap sets. For all these years, her, her mother had been collecting these documents from various family members. So they were absolutely thrilled when they came to us, um, and we began <coughs> immediately put, because there are documents that go back all the way to Gilbert Livingston, um, they were just extraordinary documents. And so we immediately started putting them into archival uh, sleeves. And the next day they came in and they were crying when they saw what we had accomplished in a very short time. And then they went out and bought us a computer. Aww. So it's very, very nice. Good, it's a good relationship. They saw and that we were That's the reality of the archives, how yeah. we stumble on things. People have things that yeah. they, they take for granted, or great, great nieces and nephews are cleaning out a house. They don't know what to do with these scrap albums, so they go to the dump. And at the dump, we're fortunate that one of our members works at the dump. So suddenly, if there is an album or a yearbook or something, at the dump, and they come back to us. So that's all part of the legacy. But let's look beyond it. This is, I put this on as a teaser because most of you wouldn't recognize what it was. Next. But they are all documents. This is parchment. And on the top, it's for uh, W. Merritt. And it's, um, it's basically a document that advertises us, this is the outside of it, opens it up and describes the parcel that the family sold and the individual who bought it. And among the documents, so many of them deal with the layout of the village from 1870 on, when the Merritt family had purchased the, uh, the Haight property and was dividing it up for the streets and putting the two streets in. And the streets' names happened to be Franklin and Merritt. Why? Because Franklin Merritt is the one at the time who had purchased the Haight property. So his indulgence was he named the two main streets after himself and his family. <laughs> so this is, again, doesn't seem to be much, but if you turn some of them over, this is the indenture, and these are the kinds of details, and these are the kinds of things that happen all the way through. The amount of money, how much is being paid, what the commitment is. So you've got a, a standard document that uh, is printed, and then it's added into it to make it to the specific person. We can have hours going through and finding all the details, but this is the kind of paper that is priceless. It could put an audience to sleep, and it's about doing that right now. So we'll continue the next. And inventories, house inventories. Stephen Haight, this is all part of the family of that had the farm that Merritt bought, the Haight farm. So the descriptors of the house, what was there, what the content was, the size of it, all the details you can imagine. So anyone doing genealogy and looking for the Haight family or the Merritt family, this is a treasure trove. And these are things that are under the radar that most people wouldn't have. Next. And things like this, the schedule and the details. So here you have 
details. Uh, this is a wagon and rigging and harnesses and a, a, a yoke. This has to do with the horses and all the equipment that was in the possession of it. So it's a Schedule B of listing an inventory, if you will, for estate purposes of what could be tallied and what was there and notarized. Next. And Schedule C. And this goes through things like rocking chairs, shoes, cooking pans, the day-to-day -day that we don't even think of that, but that's what makes the family real. And it's all the Mary family. So all the details are in it. So it's a treasure trove. We were talking earlier about uh, high school students who are looking for projects that they could use for credit for the Honor Society. This is a natural inventory. These are things that they're looking through to help coordinate. Next. And then, uh, spring wagon and rigging, complete. The carriage, two seats, blah, blah, blah. And what the value is, $25 for the full wagon. And for the two-seater, five. And set of harnesses, two. Wonderful details. And for anyone who's interested in the local history at the time, gives a pretty good sense of what the day-to-day -day families would likely have. Now, this is easy. Most of us can read this. What happens, and especially for younger people today, how many of you, if I say the word, know what Palmer method is? <laughs> Most of you should. Palmer method in school, the script, how you form the letters, how you put it together, year after year after year. Now, if I say that to a students in school today, they'll look at me blankly. Because, first of all, they don't use script. <coughs> Everything's printing and texting. <coughs> so it's a lost art. And when you have full documents, when you have full documents that are written in this 18th century flourish in script, where the letters are very confusing, it's very hard to read. Once you get used to it, it starts making sense. But F's and S's and how they interchange and trying to figure out what is the word and what does it mean. So this is all part of the treasure as well. It was also... Usually oh, and how many of you, <coughs> third grade, everyone was in third grade, how many of you had the uh, pen with nibs and an ink bottle? <laughs> Remember? Every, every desk, every desk had it. And when I was in third grade, guess what just came out? Ballpoint pens. The teachers refused to let the students use them. <laughs> you had to clean your nib. And you had to clean the nibs, absolutely, that was the point. And I taught, in part, I taught calligraphy forever. But that's the whole thing. Next. So these are the kinds of things that if, you, if your eye adjusts to them, they're relatively easy and straightforward. So that entire sack, all those documents, now are protected at the archives. So for future generations, it's an incredible reference. Yes. Would this have been a family member who did the calligraphy, or who would it have been the state or the... Uh, it depends on the document. They're all the collected documents. So these uh, very often are going to be by people hired by the estate for the inventories. But the other letters and things like that, the correspondence back and forth, they're family members. And then you've got the legal ones because they have to be on file in Poughkeepsie at the courthouse or whatever. So many of the documents are multiple documents. <coughs> and you don't use ditto paper, you know? Every single one of them is written out. Next. Ah, uh, okay, so that got out. Okay, it's all yours. I've got a couple of comments and Melody jump in whenever. But so one of the things that is uh, important to look at here is obviously you've got a big difference between this document in your next one, you've got a printed form here. This earlier one is, is interesting because if you wanted to, say, do a title search, figure out who used to own your property, what parcels that it used to be part of way, way back in, in the past, you could go to the county clerk's office in Poughkeepsie, and you have all the deed records there. This is the other side of that deed record because you would have had two copies of the deed made, one for the county to be filed in the clerk's office, one to be held, but then everything actually relating to the sale itself in terms of the notation of the lots that were sold, that's kept by the private individual. It is not filed at the county. So one of the exciting things that we have when this sort of material pops up, this is Paul Harvey's 
rest of the story. It helps us fill in gaps that would otherwise exist. And we can also tell just by looking at it that this is you know, relatively early in terms of probably pre-1860, 1870, because it is totally handwritten out. There isn't a, a pre-printed form for it, yet you go to this next item here. Now, we talked a little bit earlier about indentured servants. Indentured servants are so called because they're contracted, but mostly because the indenture, and this is, this is an 1829 document, Back in the 18th and 17th century, the indenture would actually have a neat cut along the top line here. So you would have exact copies on either side of that line, and you would prove the contract by taking the two copies, and they would fit neatly together. So the indenture was actually the cut line. Now, by the first part of the 19th century, as you can see here in just into the second quarter of the 19th century, you've lost that whole weird wavy cut line, which you'd see in 18th century records, but the nomenclature and the terminology remains. And that's one of the hardest things about becoming a lawyer today, believe it or not, is memorizing all of this terminology that has ceased to mean anything in reality. So, a hundred years earlier, in 1729, you'd see a weird cut along the top of this, now it's just a legal device to call it an indenture, and this is just another way of saying contract that we would say today. Now when we get to all of this other stuff, this inventory here in the subsequent pages, this is the inventory of an individual's estate. So of course, after a person died, normally today if there's a will, it's probated, everything is awarded out, in the 19th century, sometimes that will go straight through, but whenever there's a doubt or whenever there are legal minors involved, the courts would more often than not send someone in to take an, an official inventory of the estate. And as David pointed out, going through here, you see all sorts of different items listed relating to the estate, and you also have these schedules up here, and it specifically says at the top there, laws of 1842 and 1807. So this again reflects that development over time, not only into pre-printed forms, but pre-printed forms that are also directly linked into the changing laws of the period. So it's the growth of that legalese that requires us to hire lawyers today, because who, who among us has the time to go memorize all of these laws, all of that terminology? and figure out how all of this works. And all those different schedules deal with different fine points of inheritance law that uh, developed as American history moved forward. Which also know? seems to be, uh, and it's hard to read through from this angle, but, but you know, it seems to be suggesting that it, it, some of this is being done in order to set aside valuations for minor children or widows. Um, as a form of protection, should there not be a valid will? Um, I, this I, doesn't it say you said 1807. Is that 1867? Uh, 1842 and 1807 are the law, or maybe that is 1867. 1867. Okay. That's the uh, the angle working against me. So uh, in those years, you know, what's interesting me about this is that in many, in many cases you will not find women owning property in their own right in those periods. So. But this is suggesting to me that the, that the law in this period is trying to move toward protection of women's rights, but very, very unusual. You know, if any of you know Mills Mansion, you know, in the 1860s, um, Margaret Livingston leaves a vast estate, but it was shocking that she owned so much property in her own name um, that went directly to her. So this again, talks about setting this aside, they're doing the inventory, they realize they have to take care of the widow who obviously hasn't inherited all this stuff in her own right. So uh, that speaks to women's rights in the, in the mid-19th century as well. <coughs> Does that usually hold true? You sort of mentioned it. Um, if there was no will, then they would do probate? If there was no will, they would do a, a full court-administered settling of the estate and that sort of worst case scenario where they send in an entire investigative team to figure out exactly what's there, what the valuation is, and then a judge 
makes the decision on what is going to go to which family members. But when you're looking at early wills in general, um, and by early I mean pre-1830, um, you'll find long lists of, of, of sons inheriting, mm -hmm. but you will almost never find anything directly going to the daughters. They are expected to be taken care of by their husbands. And a lot of those early wills as well, despite New York's long tradition of recognizing women's legal rights more than other states because of the Dutch Foundation, you still have a lot of wills early on that essentially say, elder son, as part of this inheritance, you will take care of your mother and any dependent sisters, etc., that come along. So even though there is a precedent for it, women's rights are still not established to the same level that they are today. And we will move on now for a finale. Thank you. And this will go very fast. Um, most of you should recognize this building. Yes? What is it? Inn. Millbrook Inn. The Millbrook Inn. Now, why would there be an inn in Millbrook? Because there's a railroad. Because there's a railroad. <laughs> and can you guess well, when this building was built? Oh. After the railroad came. It, it was, <laughs> literally, it was set up so that when the railroad in 1870 finally opened and started coming through, visitors would have a destination. And the evolution of this building is pretty extraordinary. Now, I'm not talking about the uh, building itself. That's too tedious. But we have a treasure uh, trove that we can deal with. Most of you know Mike Spross. Do you know the name? Mike Spross taught art uh, at the local high school forever and ever. Well, his passion, his passion is to go dump digging. Now, have you heard that term? If, if, it's, if the weather cooperates, he's out with his shovel and he's digging. So, the kinds of things that he's found over the years are pretty extraordinary. And he's given quite a nice selection of what he's found to the Historical Society of Key. Now, where would you go dump digging? Okay. And what, what is a dump? Now, we've got two kinds of people or two kinds of um, uh, groups on this. You have the person or people who are very conscientious, like here, and they take all the trash and things and they go to a specific site on the property. And they usually dig a hole, put it in, cover it up. That's one type. Mike has found all of those. But there's a second type. And you can decide which group you belong to. And the second type is you have something broken and you go to the back of your property and you throw it as hard as you can, out of sight, out of mind. So he has scoured the countryside and found all of those. Now, what survives? Paper is not going to survive. Leather is not going to sur survive. Metal very often is. But there are other things too. Glass, bottles, depending on the generation. And many of you know we had a condensed milk factory here. So those condensed bottles are all over the place here. But most of the time, they were sent back, given back, so that they could be reused and filled. But not all the time. I have one thing here, thanks to Mike, to share with you. Now, can anyone guess what it might be? This helps a little bit. A teacup. Whoa. Now, what makes it special? Oh, it's broken. Throw it out. Until you look at it. Can you see what the logo is? An S and a B S. B S. What? What place would have B S on it? Bennett School! Bingo! You got it! Bennett! Bennett the, the, the china that was used at the school. Generations of students had the logo and the insignia on it. So, this is one of the ones that he found. Now, we were talking before about dates. Well, you know what happens with china, and maybe it's happened at your house too. You drop it. You, mean, you don't mean to drop it, it breaks. Throw it out. Now, at Bennett School, with the number of students, can you imagine the number of, of uh, cups, glasses, everything that were broken? So what happens? The styles are changing. 
because you go back to get new cups and the handle may be a different handle. So what Mike has been doing is tracking down all those details. So this one happens to be Bennett School. But the exhibit that we have now in the archives, and I encourage you all to come and see it, let's look at the next image. Bingo. It's a relatively modest display case, but this is one of the newest editions that we have. And it, it has actually a plastic lid, so you can't reach into it. But it includes ads from the local newspapers, just like the ones you saw that were um, in the scrapbook, a menu listing what was available, the, the courses, the number of courses, when they were being served, a plate, teacups, saucers, a, a little brochure on the Millbrook Inn, in this case, and also this. Now, what is this? <laughs> now, how many of you have hangers at home? <laughs> we all do, but the wooden hangers, that was so common a uh, way of advertising it was also a way of proving that it was the hotels and not yours. <laughs> okay, you have your name on it. So those are the kinds of things we take for granted. And those are the things that in the archives we're always looking for. So please, in your own collections and things at home, if you have teacups with logos or details that trace the history of any of the buildings, save them. The one that I have from uh, my uh, oldest brother, my oldest brother is 21 years older than I am, so he was born in 1922. And what he had, um, he gave to my middle brother, who was born in 1937. And then my middle brother ended up giving it to me when I was born in 1944. And it's a dark blue glass and bowl with someone on it. Do any of you remember Shirley Temple? <laughs> okay. Those glasses and those bowls were hugely popular. Almost every family had those Shirley Temple pieces. They were incredibly cheap. It was a promotional tool. They're wonderful. Guess what? I still have them today. There's also a drink. And a Shirley Temple is a drink, but I guarantee it was not used in those glasses. <laughs> so glasses and items for it. So this is the display case that we have. And it's for rotating exhibits, so we will be featuring items in the archives so that when people come in, they can see the kinds of things and getting you thinking about it. There are so many other items that would potentially have logos on it that we're looking for as well. And Kathy, if you had your heart's desire, what would you like? Well, I'd like silverware. Silverware. <laughs> Anything that you can, from the Milberkin or any of the buildings that no longer exist. If you have memorabilia, uh, we just received three fans from Carmine's Ice Cream Parlor um, that are wonderful. And, and so anything like that that you think of, we'd love to have it. And that, that's what makes um, uh, this quest so important. Because there are things that you might have at home that you would never think of as having any value. And yet, in point of fact, in the context of local history, it does. Let's see a few more of these. Another close-up detail. Next. That wonderful hanger. Now, most of you probably wouldn't even think about it. But if, if you go home and you have one, oh, I'd be, we'd love to have an additional one. And you can see it's got the information. Millbrook Inn, right on it. Yes? I have no idea where the Millbrook Inn is or was. It's, it's still there. The main building has been altered greatly for it. But the, if we go back to the picture, okay, what exists today, this is the original inn, that's gone. But the building behind it, which was called the Annex, still survives. Is that Bruce Hill? And it's, no, no. no this is uh, directly opposite the green, where um, um, it's Friend Street. Friend Street, thank you, on Friend Street now. If you go by it, you'll see it. So it's been uh, changed and altered. But the dump site for, for Mike was everything behind it. So they were very good about throwing all their trash in this one section. And Mike has gone through it, so I guarantee there's not much left there. What street is it facing? It's facing onto Point Street. Yes. Is it a house now? It, it's, a, it's a house, yeah. And I think it's even apartments now. It's near Miller Court, I think it's No, it's more. Right? Isn't it? Near most? Uh, no, it's no? it's farther. Um, if you if you think of the firehouse, 
where the moved. firehouse is. And just beyond that is where it was. Across the street from the firehouse. Yeah, across the street, thank you. And that's where the... next to the town hall. And, no, town hall is a block up. Okay, this is right on Front Street. And, and if you're in the, that's the area. Look through and you will see it. And the reason it was there is because that's where the train station was. The passenger station. So you get out of the passenger station, walk across the street, and that's where it would be. Is that on the historical tour? Yes. Yeah, they're there. So with that, uh, another place and there's also Well, I've got a couple. First of all, David forgot a third option for disposing of your refuse. So option number one, you go find a pit, throw it all in. Option number two, you throw it over the garden wall and it becomes someone else's problem. What's option number three? Burning. Oh, the outhouse. The outhouse. Yeah, you may think that's gross. Archaeologists and uh, model diggers alike. Love it. <laughs> the only problem is when the shaft of the outhouse is waterlogged, because in archaeological terms that tends to preserve a fresh context. <laughs> back in uh, college I was on the track to be both a historian and an archaeologist. That's not why I didn't become an archaeologist, but many of my colleagues would tell stories about you know, digging in an 1890s latrine and getting down to the waterline, oh. and then suddenly everything is minty 1890s fresh. <laughs> but the, uh, the beauty of what you can go see at the, uh, the Historical Society today is this shows you how you can combine both dug items, either archaeologically recovered or otherwise, with items that uh, are already in your collection. So here you have all of the china, that's been recovered archaeologically. There's no other way you're really going to have it. But you can supplement it with the copies of those ads. You have, of course, the hanger there. And you also have right here the, the greatest example of this, an original manuscript menu that survives, and an example of the sort of plate that it might well have been sitting on when it was originally in use. So this is a... Can you read that? Can you read it? Yes. Uh, it's quite elaborate, and also the, it gives the breakfast hours on the bottom. So you could have breakfast between 7.30 and 9, then you have the luncheon served between 1 and 2, and the dinner between 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. So very civilized for the time, so that would have been the standard. Well, when you look at the, the ceramics and you look at the menu, you know, you really can get into a discussion about class and, and society, and you know, I mean, the Holy Grail would be to find the guest register for the same time period. Because then you can begin to piece together who was coming. And, and you know, obviously this was a fairly well-to-do clientele based on what you're seeing here. The, the whole accoutrement is getting a hanger, you know, with your, with your hotel noble in on it. You know, somebody was going to great lengths to create a, an upscale tourist destination. This wasn't a boarding house. This wasn't, you know, just a lodging place. And if you came with your child, your daughter, to, uh, at Bennett, so you deposit your daughter at Bennett, and then where do you stay? At the end, at the Billboard Inn. So the clientele really uh, benefited because of Bennett. Bennett uh, benefited from the railroad, and the whole community, service community, benefited from being able to provide fresh produce to serve. And if you, depending on the generation, if you were um, Irish at this time, um, 1900, and you were looking for a job, what kinds of jobs would you have? Waitress, Waitress. <laughs> scullery maid, cleaning rooms, doing laundry. Those, for women, those are the jobs, and places like this provided that service. And if you were a man, you might be taking care of the horses. We've got wonderful images of the estate where you've got the butlers and you've got the, um, the servants and they're all dressed up in their finery. You look at the names and at that time, almost every one of them is Irish. And those, that's all part of our history. And some of you may, in point of fact, have stories in your own families about the immigration pattern, just as the young Jack Dean did and his family. Well, when the railroad came through, what was happening 
Um, and they needed people to lay the tracks, put them in a horrible job to do that. And uh, we've got reports, Tom Fury, you all know the Fury family, I think, and Tom Fury. Tom was wonderful because he talked about his father going to Ellis Island. And as Irish, as Italian immigrants were coming through, um, uh, and he, they were asking, uh, Fundi, Fundi, Fundi. Mm -hmm. And if the person said, Fundi, you've got a job, you're a stonemason. Mm -hmm. And you might say, no, no, I'm a tailor. No, 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 you're a stonemason. No, I'm a tailor. You're a stonemason. <laughs> Okay, I'll still next. You've got a job. <laughs> and the network of our families that came through to build the houses and work with the Safari, Chifari family, um, uh, is because of that. But what would happen is those individuals who were working for the Safari family, Chifari, um, they would save their money up and as soon, just as soon as they could, they'd become the tailor. They'd become um, the, the, uh, the uh, barber. They do whatever their real occupation was. So we've got that network of stories, but most of them came because the job market was there. And that's where the oral history component is so incredibly important. I'm going to be talking uh, this coming uh, several months with the society, talking about Alden Place and the stories of the Italian immigrants and the stories that they shared with us. It's a fascinating night, so make sure you put that on your calendar when you get the schedule. Come here and find out more about why Alden Place is so important. Yes? How did they, they I assume the Italians mostly arrived in Manhattan somehow? Ellis Island. Ellis Island, and then got to Manhattan. And then how did they get from Ellis Island, Manhattan, to up here? Yeah. He, he hired them. So he had a... a his network was Had getting... A, I don't know, stagecoach? Yeah. His network, uh, maybe he carried them on his back. I'm not sure, <laughs> but he got them here. And th keep in mind that you've got the train network from the city coming up. So many of them would have come by train, and he would have made the arrangements for it. And the Italian families who were here were great. Um, just, as a, just as an example, and I could go on and I won't, but as an example, on, on uh, Alton Place, and we'll talk about where that name came from, but on Alton Place, many of the um, Irish families who had been there first, who lived on the street, uh, ended up renting rooms to the Italian immigrants, mm -hmm. most of them young men. And we've got records of seven uh, young men renting the same room and, uh, on Alton Place, in what now is the Great Shade, actually. And they, why were they all in one room? <coughs> to save their money, to save every penny they could. Because as soon as they had enough, what did they do with their money? Got other people over. Sent to get their sisters, their wives, their children, whatever it may be. Barbara. Could I use this as a little table Please. stitch? For <laughs> Please. Barbara um, purse, everyone. Um, I just wanted I, to say that you may have seen posters around town, but thanks to David and all the information, okay, take there's one for Saturday and one for Sunday. Um, I, sorry, I was the co-chair of the Museum of the Streets, and when I finished it, here's the Saturday show, um, it dawned on me that there were many stories out there that I had missed because I came late to the party, and um, my nephew is a professional filmmaker, so with David's help, we set up 15 interviews, and my nephew came to town two successive summers, and we did 18 hours of filming. And he, my nephew, I came up with the idea, but my nephew did the film, and it is a beautiful, beautiful film. It has 12 um, <coughs> Milberg citizens of Italian descent, and three uh, David figures prominently in this film. Uh, Monsignor uh, Colachico is in it, and John Dyson is in it, because he loves Italy, as I do, and he has a vineyard there, and he remembers the Italians when he grew up here as a child, and remembered hearing Italians spoken in the streets. So there are 15 interviews, it's 35 minutes long, it's going to be shown, everything's free, it's a free community screening here at the Milbrook High School on Saturday, November 18th at 2 p.m. Thanks to um, a dear friend, Lois Mander, who saw it and liked it so much, she went to the Millerton Moving House and she um, sponsored us to go to the Millerton Moving House. And so we're going to be on Sunday at the Millerton Moving House as part of their Filmworks Forum. 
and it's going to be moderated by um, a man named Jonathan Galassi, who is the head of the uh, president and publisher of Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, which is a major publishing house in New York. Why you say a publisher, but he's a descendant of Italian immigrants himself, and he's gotten so interested in that story that he's become a very um, sophisticated uh, translator of the poetry of Eugenio Montale and uh, Giacomo de Apardi. So he's coming, and I think, but I'm not sure, hoping, that the Italian cons Consul General is coming to that as well. So um, everything's free. Um, we're trying to figure out whether we can get DVDs made in time. My nephew doesn't want to charge for them. Um, and it's a whole question of do we have them made in plain old DVDs, which he doesn't believe in because the quality is not very good, or Blu-ray, but he feels everybody doesn't have Blu-ray. And so we're going back and forth about all this. And I don't know that we'll have our act together by that weekend, but we'll work something out. He's incredibly busy. He's a full professor of film, an assistant professor of film, excuse me, in Missouri. He has a new baby. He has a round-the-clock uh, teaching assignment this weekend. I can't even ask him to think about producing DVDs in time for this, but it will happen. Um, we, we will figure out some way to do it. But I hope you'll come, because it's, it's very moving. Um, I cry every time I watch this, and David knows what David cries too. <laughs> we both director. cry a lot. <laughs> the interviews, the people who uh, we've been able to capture on film, they will last forever. Well, Their stories, because of the film. The format, we the don't format. know. The format will last forever. Okay, the That's format, the and, that, and their memories of playing ball on the Lincoln Place, mm -hmm. and of eating, and of everyone speaking Italian. Everyone speaking Italian because of the kids. Lots of wonderful stories mm -hmm. here in the morning. But what year did they arrive? I mean, when did they first get yeah, to the, uh, and looking Washington? Through, uh, and looking through the earliest, the earliest uh, record that we have of in individuals coming, 1890, 1891, 1892. But the bulk of them are coming a little later, 1897, 1898, 1899. But the, the first ones who were here, and Tom Fiore's family was one of the first Italian families that came into the area. So that's the backstory. And guess what? They're still coming today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for a variety of reasons. But Rotary has an international student program. And we almost every year have an Italian student coming from Italy um, and staying with local families and going to the schools and as a student for the year. Lots of different countries. But that's not going to proper intentions. So with that. With that, that's our program for the evening. Thank you all. This was our last decoding the past of 2017. But to give you a little bit of a taste, David has already let the cat out of the bag slightly. 2018 is, of course, the major centenary, 100-year anniversary of American involvement in World War I. We declared war on Germany in 1917, but 1918 was when the troops really made it over to Europe. And in order to both commemorate this anniversary and to really celebrate over 300 years of service and sacrifice, Dutchess County and the Dutchess County Historical Society will be declaring 2018 the Year of the Veteran on November 4th of this year. So in 2018, you can look forward to a number of World War I-focused programs, including our first Tavern Trail of the 2018 series, which will feature our own David Greenwood, hopefully on Alden Place, talking about the Italian experience right on the eve of World War I and how the war transformed the Italian presence here in Millbrook. And then a couple of months before that in February, I'm going to be presenting a program to you all called Documenting the Great War, which looks at the research process that we'll be going through throughout 2018 to gather as much information and stories on Dutchess County's experience of World War I as possible. We're also working with Stan and other members of the community on an oral history project focusing on veterans from the Korean War to the present, those that have not been um, focused on as much by previous projects. So we have all kinds of moving parts. Did I forget anything, Melody? Uh, well, um, the whole project, uh, talking about decoding the past and finding things, uh, we rediscovered in our collection some 331 glass plate negatives 
that um, date from primarily 1917, 18, and 19, including an unpublished, uh, previously unseen photograph of then Assistant Secretary of Undersecretary of the Navy Franklin Roosevelt leading the Welcome Home Parade in 1919, just two mm. years before he's paralyzed. So um, the significance of this collection led us to put together this year the veteran. And um, so we are digitizing. Uh, we've raised the money to have all of the photographs digitized so they'll be available. Uh, we will be hosting an exhibit of some kind of the photographs at the Wallace Center next Memorial Day, um, the weekend of their encampment. And we're working, as Will said, with Bard College and their Mobile History Band. Uh, we've been reaching out within the last month to the American Legions. We're looking to partner with them to identify veterans um, willing to participate in the project. Um, we're looking at a documentary, we're looking at a symposium, so it's going to be a big year and you know, I'll tell you all to stay tuned and, and find as many ways as you can to participate. Mm -hmm. All right, so thank you all for coming out tonight and I'll turn you to We have one more announcement. Um, this is our commercial break for the Mark Library. Hi, I'm Diane Montague. Um, we have a, we, the library's been very fortunate to get a grant for programming for veterans. So, um, Lessons and Legacies of Vietnam War are being presented on this um, November 15th. It's a Wednesday evening um, by Robert Brigham, who's a uh, professor of history and international affairs at Vassar College. This lecture that he's giving, he get, has an agent that has booked him all over the country to give this lecture. We're very fortunate to have him here at the library, so I hope people will come and participate. It's free, open to the public, bring your friends. I'll leave the flyers here. If you run out, we can make some more tomorrow and I can pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Refreshments over lights. there, and um, please make sure you come to our next program, which will be on the November, I think, 14th, and then the movie on the 18th and 19th. Thank you.